Is that working, Nora? It is. All right. Uh, and you can hear me okay? We can. Okay, well, let's go ahead and get started. Um, welcome, everyone. Beautiful uh, evening. I do see some uh, cumulonimbus clouds over Mount Washington right now, so hopefully we won't uh, have a storm come in and we'll lose power. But um, uh, this is a new program. It's the first time I've done this. It's um, it's going to be featuring the, the wildlife that make the White Mountains special. And uh, it's, it's not just the White Mountain National Forest. It's essentially the three northern counties of New Hampshire and Oxford County and in Maine, the area that we really consider the, the White Mountain region. And before we, we go along um, with the program, I, I wanted to uh, go ahead and discuss the, the moose gross natural product answer. And I know some people got it right off uh, at 1,417,500 hundred thousand nuggets per year. Uh, so that's a lot of nuggets. And if you if you lined them up uh, one inch long, uh, that's a bonus question that I guess we'll have to figure out at some point. But um, moose nugget ice cream, you can get moose nugget earrings, uh, all kinds of uh, things for this. So let's talk about what wildlife is. And a lot of people just think of wildlife as mammals uh, that you have out there. But you know, we traditionally refer to wildlife as anything that's undomesticated animal species that live independently of humans in a natural conditions. And uh, usually we think of mammals and birds and fish. Sometimes some people don't, they separate the uh, mammals and the fish, but, um, but we now, we include insects, of course, and even native Florida, flora, the, the, the plants that we have. And we've got some wonderful habitat here in the White Mountains in New Hampshire. And, and beautiful streams and waterfalls and um, wetlands. We've got wonderful ponds and lakes and bogs and fens that we can visit that provide great habitat. <clears throat> Northern hardwood forest where we have our sugar maple and yellow birch and beech trees and, and, the, uh, and the wildlife that live in those particular forest. And we have spruce fir forest, including some that are really quite old. Uh, the Nancy Brook uh, Research Natural Area, that 1,500 acres of old growth spruce and, and fir. And of course, we've got the alpine zone. And so that's really what makes it different for the rest of uh, really New Hampshire. White region has uh, several thousand acres above tree line and this is just an example this is the Bigelow sedge community on Mount Washington we're looking at uh, Mount Clay and the in the uh, middle ground here and it it has some unusual insects uh, some unusual butterflies that I'll talk about later and has an unusual bird that actually nests here and that is the American pipit and I'll also be talking about birds tonight so um, I'm including flowers um, in with wildlife. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that because I really had to pick and choose um, what feet, what species to cover. But uh, I did want to mention pink lady slipper, an orchid which is flowering right now and it's really quite abundant. Uh, both the pink and the white ones are <coughs> out and quite abundant. And of course, Rhodora is in full flower. Uh, Rhododendron candens. One of our beautiful bog plants. Uh, this one's next to a tamarack and some um, a Labrador tea also in the background. So beautiful flowers just exploding around our, our lakes and ponds. So get out and, and check it out. And of course, we have you know about 120 species of um, alpine arctic plants, including diapensia. Diapensia is, is not just found in the White Mountains. There is a, a couple of islands off the coast of Nova Scotia, for some reason, Briere Islands, that uh, also feature this species. But this is a you know, real unique cushion type plant that we have. It's flowering now uh, on Mount Washington and, and several other locations. But let's go ahead and we'll start talking about uh, some of the mammals that, that are favorites. This is... Mm. Uh, one of uh, certainly um, a favorite of many people. This is a Eastern Bobcat. Scientific name is, is Lynx Rufus. And I put the 
the subspecies, which is actually the nominate species, the, the so you have lynx rufus, rufus but uh, you can call it a bobcat or you can just call it the eastern bobcat because that's the one that we see around here. Um, it gets its name from a short stubby tail, bob tail, and typically about six inches long, uh, has prominent spots on it and it's real reddish in, in color. Um, they could be, you know, active at, at any time of day. Of course, to get the best photographs, uh, unless you have a game camera, uh, you, you really want to do it on a sunny day. And this one just looks like a big kitty cat that's in uh, on a path uh, going out to our, our compost uh, area. Um, they, they tend to, you know, hunt more at the crepuscular hours. That's dawn and dusk. And that's, of course, the best time for you as a wildlife observer to get out uh, dawn and dusk. And, and I'm a dawn person. I, I love that half hour before sunrise. That's my favorite time. And maybe that's why I'm not a person that has picked up really. I usually get up pretty early. Um, they're a really good climber. Um, oh, one of the other features, I don't know if you can see my little pointer here, is on their legs, there's usually these black bars that um, they have on their legs. It's a good thing, but, but it's really the reddish color and the spots uh, that you see here. And then that, that facial color, that pink nose, which is pretty common with a lot of, lot of mammals. They've got excellent hearing and excellent vision. And um, I took these pictures through the window uh, actually two panes of glass through our house and it was uh, on a pile of snow where the plow had, um, had pushed it up this, this winter. Um, they breed in April, gestations 60 days and males typically weigh about 27 pounds. So um, females are, are, are smaller and they typically average about 17 pounds. This one was climbing up in an apple tree just investigating. Um, they love hunting for squirrels, uh, mice and voles and things like that. Uh, next species that we'll talk about is the Canada lynx, lynx canadensis canadensis. And oh, I spelled canadensis wrong of all things. I'll get that later. Uh, this one was up in success. Uh, this is not my photo. This is actually from a game camera. Uh, Friends of Fish and Game <clears throat> allowed me to use these photographs. But uh, we're fortunate in northern New Hampshire, White Mountain region, we do have, do have Canada lynx. And uh, we're not sure about the population, but we know it's a breeding population. And in large part, because of all of the we'll call it heavy timber harvesting north of Berlin and the success area, Success Pond Road, where several thousand acres were, were essentially cut over. It produced incredible habitat for the snowshoe hare, which is the primary uh, prey item of the Canada lynx. And so uh, they've done very well and the, the lynx moved in. In this picture, it again, another one from uh, New Hampshire Fish and Game. Uh, that shows the incredible size of their paws. Their paws, the tracks are actually larger than that of a mountain lion. They're just so big. And check out that, those hind legs. I mean, the, the, uh, the rump area is higher than the head of the Canada lynx. And they're really designed for speed. And anatomically, they're, they're really kind of shaped like a, a large snowshoe hare. They're built for speed, not, not for long chases, but uh, their primary food is, is snowshoe hare. Uh, another picture, this is up in the Dixville area. There's a pair of Canada lynx from a couple, couple years ago. And as far as we know, the lynx are not going further south than the Kankamaugus Highway. <clears throat> this particular one is in the Zeeland Valley in the uh, it, it shows as November 4th. They like to walk on logs and a lot of predators will, they'll go out of their way to walk on top of a log because there's often a food item underneath those logs, whether it be a snowshoe hare, uh, maybe a red squirrel or, or a rodent of some kind. So you'll often see them doing that. So here's a, here's a good, um, comparison between Canada lynx 
and the eastern bobcat. And, and what we're looking at, first of all, is the ear tufts on the Canada lynx, the one on the left. Those ear tufts are a couple inches high. And if you look at the bobcat, you know, they just barely got a, um, uh, in ear tufts, so there's really not much. And then, then the other thing is, you look at their their cheek tufts on the lynx. I mean, it, those are pretty good tufts of fur right there. Uh, overall, the color on the Canada lynx more of a grayish, whitish color blends in perfectly well in that twilight that you have in the in the boreal forest region. Um, and let's see what else to say about the Canada lynx. Um, they really are a specialist on, on hunting snowshoe hare. And again, if you have some habitat around your home, you, know, you get 10, 15, 20, whatever, and you have some trees that are, that are down, try limbing the tops of the trees because you'll have a variety of predators that will often walk on top of these. This was in Jefferson uh, a few years back, happened to be tracking some a Canada lynx uh, female because we actually were able to get a DNA sample off of some scat. Anybody um, want to guess? You can put in the chat room here who made this track and my glove is down there for comparison. And um, I'll give you a few seconds here to think about that. It's a little hard to see, but it is a cat track uh, that we're looking at. Um, it's actually a bobcat. Uh, and it's carrying something. Anybody know what it might be carrying? Well, it was carrying a snowshoe hare. And it was just going back and forth, side to side with the snowshoe hair in its mouth. And uh, this, I took this at, at Pondicherry. And snowshoe hair, again, if, if you had one food item in the type of forest that we live in here, it would be the snowshoe hair. So many creatures depend on it. Um, you know, whether it's uh, the weasels, uh, the owls, the hawks, particularly goshawks, uh, or the predators, a coyote, um, and, and the lynx and the, and the bobcat, they just really rely on it. Uh, snowshoe hair, also called the varying hair because it changes color. It takes about 10 weeks for that cycle to occur in the spring and the fall. And what's interesting about some places is that as we're seeing climate change and, and the warming winters and less and less snow, you certainly can see a lot more snowshoe hair in, in October and November that are white against the brown or green background. And that's not good. And so it appears that they're evolving naturally to become more of a dappled color with uh, patches of white and, and brown. And if you go out to the Cascades and um, Northern Cascades in Washington, they actually don't change color, they, they stay brown. And here's another picture. This uh, actually I took this last summer. Um, this was in July and it still has a, a white belly. Uh, was not very far away from this particular snowshoe hare. It's just kind of keeping that eye on me there and wondering if I'm a friend or foe. It took us a few days ago at Pondicherry. It almost looks like a kangaroo. Well, maybe not, but uh, it's a really chunky snowshoe hair and it still has a few patches of white on its back. And it looks like a few ticks on its, uh, on its ear. And, um, and I, I just, I go out there every day and, and I often will see this particular snowshoe hair in this, in this grassy area. So um, a lot of people get confused by the direction of travel on snowshoe hairs. And uh, these are the hind feet here and these are I just hit the wrong button there sorry and the small ones are the are the front feet but what's happened is that the way they run so this this animal is actually going from left to right is that they put their um, their hind feet in front of uh, their front feet so here's an example this is a snowshoe hare this is not my photo this is from uh, up in Canada but you can see those enormous feet and you can see those hind feet and the front feet. And, and so that's the direction that they're going. So snowshoe hare, I, if you want to have a good, healthy wildlife population, you want to try to manage for uh, snowshoe hare. 
Another animal that changes color in the wintertime, uh, we've got a few of those, is the long-tailed weasel or the, or the ermine. Um, in the summertime, it, it goes from this uh, pretty much all white except the black tip tail to uh, a brownish color and then it has a cream color and almost a, a yellow belly on it. Um, they're about 10 ounces in size, um, you know, fairly large for one of the weasels. Uh, very high metabolic rate, so it needs to eat all the time. And so it just tends to, to move around. Um, I see them at our bird feeders. They, they come up uh, and try to get suet out of the feeders, which they do. And uh, they're also going after the red squirrels that we, we have in the yard. The range uh, only goes up pretty much up to the U.S.-Canada border. It doesn't go much further. Whereas the short-tailed weasel, uh, very close cousin, also called an ermine in the wintertime, um, that one goes all the way on up into the Arctic. And uh, that one, the difference is, of course, the, it, it's a white belly in the summertime instead of a cream-colored belly. And it's only three to four ounces in size. So it's, it's pretty small. Uh, they both have a black tip on the tail. And that's to... Uh, fake out the predators such as hawks or owls that might be flying down. They'll, when they're white and they're on snow, the, uh, the hawk will see the, this, this black tail and will go after it and come up with nothing. So uh, they feed um, primarily on voles, the short-tailed weasel. We have both the short-tailed and the long-tailed. If you have a picture of one, you can generally, if you can get them lined up, the uh, long-tailed weasel has a tail that's over half the length of the body, and the short-tailed is, is certainly less. And here's a, this is a long-tailed weasel. This one actually killed a uh, snowshoe hare. Very large animal, probably 10 times the size of it. it I was following it, it was going up a, a gravel road in Granby, Vermont, and it jumped on the back of the snowshoe hare and bit it. In, in the back of the neck and severed the spine and killed it. And it's an amazingly strong animal and it was uh, dragging the snowshoe hare up over the, over the snowbank. Uh, next animal in the Mustelid family is, is the mink. And uh, check out that pink no, uh, nose that it has here. Uh, it's larger, somewhat stockier than, than the other weasels. Uh, you typically find them along streams and lakes, uh, ponds and, and bogs. They don't get too far away from, from water. Um, they prey on, on uh, muskrats and they really like muskrats, but they'll also go for um, uh, waterfall and, and, and potentially will go after uh, loons, uh, loon eggs and particularly on, on nests. So that's uh, something. And of course, we all know about them. They've been bred for captivity for, uh, for their fur. So minks have, um, have been really um, had a hard time with, uh, with that uh, type of a life in those cages just to be killed. And of course they have these white patches. Like many of our mammals, they have these white throat patches. Uh, next, next mammal, next size up is the river otter. It's, it's one of my favorite uh, species. It's, um, it's got uh, more of a tubular, tubular shape to it. And you'll often see them a quarter mile or more uh, in the wintertime. You'll see their tracks that they, they're traveling. They're going to the next body of water. Um, they can be up to 30 pounds weight and they'll be three to four feet long. Uh, typically a carnivore. They love to eat fish. And I have a couple of friends who have fish ponds here in Jefferson. And they both tell me that it's either the otter or the osprey that come in and take the trout out and clean them out quite a bit. They'll also eat crayfish, uh, mussels, freshwater mussels, and frogs. Uh, they'll even find frozen frogs in, in streams. And they will go after muskrats and, and other water birds. In the wintertime, we all know that they love to slide down a hill. They have this loping run followed by a slide and then a loping run. And uh, a group of uh, otters, by the way, is called a romp. And typically it's, it's the female 
and the young, the uh, usually two, rarely three. Sometimes they'll include the male. So usually you'll see a family of three or four otters uh, swimming around in the summertime. And uh, moving on up, the um, oh, here's another couple of pictures here of, of otters. Uh, and they're going to be kind of up and down over the water. And you'll see their tails go up. And, and try counting them. It's, it's not that easy because they are not uh, synchronous swimmers like we enjoy watching on, on TV. Uh, but they're really cool. If you happen to get up close, they tend to be pretty curious. And particularly if they're eating, uh, they really make these crunching noises uh, when they're eating crayfish and, and freshwater mussels. Okay, now to the beaver. Uh, beaver, the ecosystem engineer that we have, Castor canadensis. I mean, it's, it's really what made North America famous in its early days, particularly Canada with the Hudson Bay um, Company. Um, the weight, 35 to 65 pounds. I guess the record is 105 pounds. And a uh, little side note, in, um, my wife and I were down in Argentina several years ago, and they have beavers down at the, uh, in, the, in the tip of Argentina, Tierra del Fuego, that they released, they brought them from Canada and they had a army garrison, Argentine army garrison down there, and they wanted to give them some work. Um, and so they thought that they, raising beavers down there would be a good thing. So unfortunately they escaped and now they're working their way through uh, Chile and, and Argentina, cutting all the trees down. So it, it never worked out for, for raising them for fur. Uh, but their favorite food is, uh, of course, in the wintertime, it's aspen and birch. And so aspen and birch are a really important species. If, if you can find a way to manage for some aspen and birch on your property, it's, it's really good, particularly if you're a large forest landowner. And I know the national forest and the state forest, they, they tend to try to focus on creating aspen habitat because it is so important for wildlife. Um, in the summertime, they eat aquatic plants and tubers, um, and they'll even eat leaves and, and uh, grass. Uh, in the wintertime, they eat the inner bark, the cambium layer of uh, branches that they've cached in the bottom of ponds. There'll be a couple thousand pounds of, of branches that they've cut and stuck in the mud that they'll be able to access in over the winter. Beavers tend to live in colonies. They um, uh, they, they are an amazing engineer. Um, they build dams, they build canals, they're able to cut trees down uh, and directionally fell, and they're able to build incredible lodges. There's an example, they move. Uh, it's not coming in. They move rocks and, and, and that. Um, and the lodges, this is a, this would have been this fall. This is an active lodge. You can see the mud that's been banked on on this particular lodge, um, and so it is a it is an active lodge. On the top of the lodge, there's actually an air hole in here that they need to have that, and that's that's how they can get fresh air in the winter time. And then they have a little tunnel that that comes out that they can um, uh, get out in in the winter time. So occasionally you'll have an otter will make its home in, in one of these things. So they mark their territories. These colonies don't want other beavers intruding on their territory. Like we often will put a or sign in. They put an ascent mound that's from this castor gland. And, uh, and I, I recommend if you see one of these mounds, you, you'll, you'll often see them along streams and that pick it up and smell it. It's just a really wonderful smell. Uh, and, and I enjoy uh, smelling that. Again, they tend to be nocturnal. Um, oh, and this is their scat. It's just, yeah, you know, it's about an inch and a half long. It tends to be, you know, kind of a, a cube. Uh, and it's just sawdust that you find. And I had been opening up some beaver dams to let the water out. And I would occasionally find some of these uh, beaver, beaver scat. So even though they're engineers and they do wonderful things for the environment, occasionally they're in places where you don't want them, such as along this power line. And these are, are wooden poles that they're going to have to replace at some point. Um, you get all that water in there, it washes roads out, 
of the block colors and and to create a problem. This is um, this is back at Pondicherry, and this is at a place called Cedar Marsh, and they they dammed up. Um, particular stream, they often go under bridges or especially culverts. They'll block it, raise the water level, and it'll be coming across the road. And soon, sooner or later, the road will wash out. The uh, Trails Bureau in the Randolph area, <clears throat> they they had to spend you know probably sixty, seventy thousand dollars this spring on fixing trails that have been washed out by the beavers. So, uh, one alternative is to trap them in the summertime and and to kill you know ten, twenty, thirty of them. And the other alternative is to work with them. And here's a tool that I typically use. It's just a bigger potato rake. Um, I open up the beaver dams. Typically where the stream is, that's usually the, the best place to open them up. And I use the power of the running water to, to wash away all of the materials that were, were put there. And what we're doing at Pondicherry is we're putting in beaver deceivers. And a beaver deceiver devices, and this one actually has a, a 60 foot pipe, but the one at Cedar Marsh has a 90 foot pipe. It's 15 inches in diameter. And this, this wooden frame here is what we call a filter box. And that is out there in water. And the beavers can't figure out how to dam this up because it's fairly deep water. And they don't dam around it. And the pipe goes right through their dam and they, they uh, they're not able to to block the flow. So we can maintain the water level that we want to have. If if it's too low, we can we can raise it up, and if it's too high, we can we can dig it out a little bit more. So uh, that's what we're trying to do. It's going to improve the bird habitat, and it's also going to protect the marshes. The guy that's doing it is Skip Lyle from Beaver Deceivers International, and the. Uh, the initials on his uh, on his truck license plate is BDI, and he says, you know, beavers have BDIs, and I said, oh, it's also Beaver Deceiver International, so it's kind of neat. Anyways, he's working on one of the filter boxes here, and uh, and we still have a couple to go, but they're working out real well. We put two more in in Randolph. We didn't have to kill the beaver family, so we want to we want to um, be able to. Uh, um, coexist with beavers without having to um, kill them. And beaver lodges are a wonderful place to visit in the wintertime. You got to be a little bit careful because um, the ice can be really thin where the um, uh, where their little channel is inside inside of the hut. But these are just coyote tracks that are around this particular beaver lodge, but they are snug as a bug. And you can go up there and you can see the frost crystals on that air hole. And, and they know that Dave is up there on snowshoes on the lodge and checking them out, but they're safe. All right, let's, uh, let's move on. This a uh, couple weeks ago, I was um, doing a survey out at Pondicherry on a Sunday and I happened to, um, to see a bull and a uh, and a cow um, off in the distance, and I said, "Ah, I think I'm going to be able to get by them." I was on a power line, and so I was working my way around them. I don't want to get within 150 feet of them, and they knew I was there, so I had stopped. I stopped on a bridge, a snowmobile trail bridge, and all of a sudden I hear this noise, and out through this cow. A, and a yearling checking me out. And I said, I got two moose on the right. I got two moose on the left. I got a big swamp behind me. I'm standing on a bridge over a stream and in front of me is another big swamp. So I said, I don't know what I'm gonna do. But, you know, I always look at the ears. If the ears are laid back, uh, that's a pretty tense moose and you could be attacked at that uh, point there. So I waited. Um, uh, the yearling was really interested in, in checking me out. Uh, it had lost a, a fair amount of food to the chicken infestation. But at this time of the year, it was about 85 degrees then, uh, that they're going to survive. Um, they, they really won't need it. So um, I was able, uh, again, as I say, the, the two, it was four moose in one place, and they were kind of keeping an eye on each other, less interested in, uh, in me. Here's the bull that was off in the distance. And, and if you notice the ear, it's actually has a fork in it. And that's probably the result. This is a bull, obviously. Um, 
that was probably a result of a fight last year between bulls and it, it got its ear torn and it's, it's healed up. Uh, don't often see that, but that, that occasionally happens. What's interesting about, about the moose is that they can grow an inch of, uh, of antler a, a day. And, and, and actually um, uh, in two months, they can have a 60 pound rack. So there's no other mammal in the world that, that develops that quickly. So it, it's a huge amount of calcium that they uh, tend to use up. Uh, and the bulls lose their antlers every year. And, and usually in December, sometimes as late as February, they lose them. Uh, sometimes one at a time, sometimes a, a pair of them. Uh, often they're devoured by mice who are also looking for, for the calcium. And this area on top here is called um, the main here. And this is a dewlap here. We're not really quite sure what the dewlap is for. We think it's, um, it's a sexual attractant for the uh, females. Um, we're not totally sure. Uh, the bulls can be 800 pounds in size. Um, this is actually a young bull. The, um, uh, the, the, the rack tends to be bigger and bigger every year. Uh, moose, you know, they'll, they can go eight to 12 years for, for an older moose. And they have this huge hump here, you know, kind of like a grizzly bear. It's, it's muscle so that they can move things around. And this is a moose wallow. Um, wallows are, are areas that they love to roll around in. And in the fall, in September, the males, the bulls, love to uh, urinate in these muddy areas and roll around in them. It's irresistible to the females, apparently. So, uh, but it also keeps, you know, the flies and things like that off. So, uh, amazing creature. Um, I mean, it looks like it was designed by a committee, but uh, they are, they are pretty, pretty effective. They love, they love to browse on, on hardwoods, but they're, you know, they'll even do balsam fur, but uh, particularly shrubs that have been browsed before, they'll go back and, and, and go at it. And one of the best places in your neighborhood is, is areas that have power lines and this vegetation underneath and you know gets all that sunlight and so there's lots of nutrients going in so that's often a good place to see moose. If the temperature is about 75 degrees or above forget it they're probably going to be lying down in a cool place so just wait until morning or or after um, uh, dusk when it cools down for them to come out. Um, you know they uh, they'll often take the inner bark of uh, red maple um, and uh, mountain ash and other things like that and feed. They'll eat up to 50, 60 pounds of browse a day in the wintertime. And this is, of course, what they leave behind, not the lens cap, but, uh, uh, but the moose nuggets here. And that was posted we had gross natural product. And we really don't have a a totally good handle on how many pellets that are in each pile. Uh, we have an idea that they'll, they'll defecate about 15 times a day. I think it's 12 to 15. And, and you know, our thoughts are that it's probably around 100 of these nuggets. So if you get a chance, go out and um, this fall, uh, say in October, and you see these piles, go ahead and take a picture. And then you get on the computer screen and you can count them and let us know because we'll have a survey here. You would think some graduate student has already done this, but apparently they haven't, but because I haven't been able to find it. And thanks to Rick Vanderpoel, I, I didn't have any good photographs of what we call coprophiles, fungus that grows on dung. And this is a special one here. It's, it's, it's not particularly rare, but some people say it's rare. It's moose dung fungus. And look at those tiny little mushrooms that are growing right there. So, so what happens in the, in the fungus world is that they release spores and the moose, it gets on the vegetation that the moose eat and, and it goes in the intestine and gets worked up. And some of the lucky spores end up going and, and pooped out and growing on the uh, on the moose poop, and so you end up finding this moose dung fungus. And um, you know, it's check it out. It's pretty neat stuff, and um, and and get a picture if you can. So moose are really declining in New Hampshire. There's a number of reasons, and the winter tick is probably one of the big things. You know, we had 
over 8,000 moose at one time. We had a lot of heavy timber harvesting, uh, particularly in the White Mountain region in the North Country. Back in the 1990s, it was for a spruce budworm outbreak. And so you created this habitat where there's lots of browse, the twigs that they eat. And so you had this population explosion of them and also, you know, snowshoe hare and, and other animals. And then the winter tick population built up. And these, these ticks that affect moose, they'll also get on deer, but it, it's really bothersome on, on the moose, is that they will have 60, 70,000 of them. And the moose try to get rid of them by rubbing against trees or rocks. And they rub their fur off and they, they tend to freeze to death. Plus, they also have a blood loss, and that's not good. So, population's down to about 3,500 um, right now. That's the latest that we know. That's what they're they're trying to to, to keep it at. There's still a, a small hunting season in some areas. There's still too many. They're trying to lower the population to try to get rid of the winter ticks that we have. And and there's also a problem with the uh, brainworm that that white-tailed deer. So this is an example of winter tick infestation, and this was a moose. We call them ghost moose, and this has almost lost all of its all of its fur. And if it was later on in the year, this this moose would not have a good chance of survival. It's the loss of blood, and it just doesn't have a you know thick winter coat to be able to survive the brutal winter. But this one probably will make it. Uh, moving on. Um, Black bear, one of our favorites, uh, Ursus americanus. There's lots of black bears in the White Mountain region. Uh, they tend to be omnivores and uh, they love to eat grass. You know, grass is a big part of their diet. Uh, of course, they love sunflower seeds too. If you if you got a bird feeder out, still they um, um, you know I'll often see scat that it's full of sunflower seeds. So they'll eat whatever they can. They're scavengers. Um, we don't want to feed bears because they tend to come back and they tend to get in, in trouble. Uh, this was a bear in our backyard checking out our clothesline and on a rainy day um, and uh, kind of a cute bear. Uh, so so there's, a, there's a fair amount of them. In the fall, <clears throat> they, they go into what's called hyperphagia. Hyperphagia is when they go in a feeding frenzy, like kind of like what we do. Um, uh, at Thanksgiving time, where we uh, want to have uh, clothing that's expandable, we eat a lot of food. Well, these guys are eating about 25,000 calories a day, and it's just a huge amount of food. And so one of the food items that they love is American beach, and you can see the claw marks that are, that are going up on this beech tree. And so they'll climb these beech trees, and they'll sit in a crotch of a beech tree and pull the branches towards themselves, and they'll bite the branches and pull it in. And, and, and before you know it, it looks like a squirrel's nest up in the tree. In some trees, you'll see three, four, five of these, what we call bear nests. Well, the bears don't nest in the tree, but it looks like a bear nest in there because they're eating these, uh, these beech nuts. And there's actually a field guide to aging bear claw marks on beech trees, of course. You'll see them on ash, on aspen trees too, um, on the bark, and, and they tend to heal over. And here's some scat. You know, here's another citizen science opportunity for you. And, uh, you know, if you're out in the woods and you see some bear scat, they often have lots of seeds and, and berries in there. And so, you know, put it in a plastic bag, bring it home and plant it and see what comes up. It's a it's an interesting experiment to see what they've been eating. So let's talk a little bit about the population um, uh, that we have of, of black bears in, in, in New Hampshire. In the White Mountain region, we've got about, I think about 800 black bears. So the goal is this, this straight red line over here, uh, you know, depending on the year. And, and the goal is to have somewhere under, 5,000 black bears in New Hampshire. Currently, it's up closer to 6,000. So, so there is hunting of, of black bears um, and, and that that's, goes on. But uh, uh, moving on here. Um, and there are some conflicts. This is, of course, uh, a family of bears. They found a, a bird feeder. Uh, normally, we, 
we take our bird feeders in on April 1st and uh, we pull them out again until, well, supposedly December 1st, but we usually have snow sometime in November and we put them out then. Uh, they're pretty strong animals and they're enjoying this particular bird feeder. And in, in looking at the conflicts, this the latest information is only 2018. If you look at this, the biggest source of conflicts is actually garbage and dumpsters. And, and they're tools that you can use. There's bear-proof dumpsters and, and so forth and, and different garbage containers. And that's why if you go to a campground, particularly on a public campground or even a private campground, they have to have dumpsters that are bear-proof. Um, so it's 30% of the problems. And then bird feeding is 17% and uh, then you look at the green over here, chickens and poultry, another 25%. So you look at that, it's almost two thirds of the problems that we have with problem bears is caused in just these three things. If, if we could handle the bird feeding and the garbage dumpsters and uh, maybe the chickens, uh, we would do pretty well. And beehives are, are up there, but there are ways to, to, to take care of that. So interesting um, numbers. Well, let's talk a little bit about um, uh, some of the other creatures that we have. And I think I'm doing okay on time. I'll have to move along here. American Martin, one of my favorites, used to be called a pine martin. Um, and I took this picture up at Mizpah Hut. I was um, uh, up there and I, I just happened to be sitting down at the middle of winter and some gray jays were coming down and, and checking me out. And all of a sudden they started going crazy. I didn't know what it was. And there I saw a Martin had come out and was checking me out. Uh, they have uh, about three pounds for, for a big one, about two feet long. And they've got pretty big ears. What's really neat is their throat patch. Typically is, is almost an orange or cinnamon color. And each of them is unique. So they have a different one for each one. This is on the uh, Crawford path. I happened to stop at a trail junction where somebody was feeding the Canada Jays and they left some gorp, some peanuts and raisins and things like it. And there was a Martin that was actually feeding on it. And unfortunately it was choking on a raisin or something. I said, oh gee, I'm gonna have to do the Heimlich maneuver on a on a Martin here and I'll get all bitten up and everything. But fortunately it expelled it and uh, and I went on. But I, I did get several interesting pictures here. So uh, this is a trap for a Martin, uh, American Martin. And, and the trap is actually a photo trap. And you can see the tracks going up here. This is off the Kankamaugus Highway. And how many Martin do you see here? There's two to Martin, and here's one that's standing. I mean, it looks like a prop right here. Here's another one up here. And so this particular trap is designed to get a picture of the throat patch. It's just like humpback whales and orcas. You actually can determine um, uh, which individual it is because they all have these unique throat patches. So kind of neat. And what they use to bait them it's on, then, if you want to watch it. What's that? Oh, I missed it. Okay. Um, this is a sardine uh, bait trap. Uh, they're, they're attracted to that. And, and Fish and Game is able to, to get some pretty good pictures of that. The Fisher, uh, also called Fisher Cat and the Black Cat. You go up to Pittsburgh, there's a road called the Black Cat Road up near the border. And that's where it comes from. Dark brown upper body. This one was by uh, one of our bird feeders. Uh, glossy black legs. It's a carnivore. And this is a specialist. It eats porcupines. And it takes about an hour for them to really effectively get after a porcupine. But it, snowshoe hair, I happened to see one uh, chasing a snowshoe hare. And the snowshoe hare was coming towards me. And, and I got to within 10 feet of one of these fishers and they kept going. Loves dense, mature forest. Good place to see them is up off the Crawford path. And it also, uh, Martin loved to eat squirrels. Usually they find them in their middens. Uh, these red squirrels body is typically a, kind of a rusty red in the summertime. Now when we see them, they, they 
really look red, but in the winter time, uh, they're gray and uh, have that white belly. Red squirrels, omnivores, they'll eat um, uh, both seeds. They love uh, all kinds of uh, conifer seeds, and they'll also eat birds, bird eggs, and whatever else they can find. And uh, I guess you probably have had a few of them at your bird feeders if you have that. Um, the tail has a mix of red and black and yellow right at the tip, and they're um, quite abundant. They have typically one one brood a year, uh, and they love these um, conifer forests, and, and they tend to hang out in, in cavities at night. Uh, one of our favorites is the eastern chipmunk. Uh, when, you, when you see a chipmunk, you know, look for these two black stripes. In the middle is uh, some white, and in the other side has, has the same combination. And we only have the eastern chipmunk. We don't have the least chipmunk. But they got these huge cheek pouches here. And, uh, and they, they're a true hibernator. And when they come out, often in the end of March, and you have your bird feeders out, they are going for the bird feeders. And they start, actually, they start breeding almost right after they get out of hibernation. I guess it gives them something to do. Uh, moving along here, we've got the porcupine and uh, sometimes called the quill pig. Um, and, and they have about 30,000 quills. This one has blue eyes, a real pretty one. Um, it, but the belly is protected as is the nose. There's no quills on, on the nose. They love to eat the inner bark of trees and um, they love tamarack, hemlock. Uh, they'll often snip the branches of a hemlock tree and drop it to the ground. Deer will often you know, be feeding on that. So if you see that, it's probably um, a porcupine. They'll go for maple trees. They love to have, uh, if you have a canoe paddle that has sweat on it, or uh, you know, some tools that you left outside that have sweat, you'll often will get them chewed up. Or your boots. I've, I've had some interesting porcupines, including $2,000 worth of damage to, uh, to a truck I had. About one in 10,000 porcupines tends to be an albino. They have a fairly high frequency for albinism. I'm not sure what the reason is, but this one, as you can see, has pink feet and uh, pink eyes and um, a little bit of a pink belly. And a friend of mine told me it was on the mud pond trail. He came over and he says, he says, there's a koala bear in the woods out there. And I, I says, Jay, you haven't been drinking, have you? He says, no, I don't drink. And he says, I said, all right, I'll come up. So I grabbed the headlamp and went out. And sure enough, it was this albino porcupine and uh, just really kind of cool to, to see. Okay, red fox. Uh, I mean, this is a designer animal. This is a, you know, really a beautiful animal. It's widespread in North America, um, all the way up into the Arctic region. Um, the one thing, the tip of the tail, always white. Uh, it's different color phases, but regardless of the color phase, it's, it's always a white tip on the tail. They tend to be um, um, hunt singly. They, they uh, often will hunt in fields. Again, this was up on a, pl a plowed area on the, on the bank. Uh, coyotes love to prey on, on the red fox. So you won't find red fox in areas where there's lots of uh, coyotes. And Charlie Nims uh, 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 graciously gave me two photographs of a gray fox. My photographs are terrible compared to his. Um, gray fox have a black uh, tip on the tail versus the white. They're shorter um, and they do have a longer neck and their, their, um, their muzzle is also a little bit shorter. But if you look at, um, and of course the face and the back tends to be gray. But if you look at the sides of the neck and, and the belly, uh, there's a lot of orange, not the, not the red that you see of the red fox, but uh, more of an orange. And Charlie thought this was a sparrow that the gray fox had, had found. Gray fox have retractable claws and they are really good tree climbers. And some people have joked that they're kind of the missing link between the cat and the dog and the fact that they can uh, climb trees and they love to eat fruit. They love apples and they will get in your garden. You know, some people say that, um, that uh, gray fox are, you know, really, really shy of people, but I know a number of people that have them 
uh, under their barn foundations and so forth, and, and, and they do see them. I'm move on real quick because uh, we're running out of time here. Just wanted to mention some of the other wildlife that we have in the White Mountain region, and you don't find it uh, further south in, um, in southern New Hampshire. Mink frog is one of them. Uh, mink frogs have a tendency to smell a little bit like onions. Uh, they have a unique call um, and a unique pattern here. Uh, really kind of a neat frog that you find in our, our northern bodies of water. And I was working on a, a publication, I still am, is on, it's kind of on the symbols of the White Mountains. And, and I asked a friend of mine, Pam Hunt, what would you consider to be the dragonfly of the White Mountains? You know, typically found just in the White Mountains. He told me, he says this one, the ringed emerald. It's found in Grafton and Coas counties only and at elevations above 1800 feet. So you folks in Carroll County need to find a ringed emerald uh, somewhere in one of the um, uh, mountains that you have uh, down in the Mount Washington Valley. So anyways, this is um, a you know, fairly uncommon species, the ringed emerald, and it was my choice for the symbol of the White Mountains in the Odonata or the dragonfly um, family. And we also have some endemic butterflies. One of the subspecies, the White Mountain Arctic, there is the, the dominant species further in the Arctic, but only on uh, Mount Washington and the Presidential Range do you have these species. And the White Mountain fritillary, um, they, they love a particular kind of goldenrod that you would find on Mount Washington. So again, really unique species. And of course, we have a wingless grasshopper, the alpine boonie grasshopper. You don't find that down in Portsmouth and Manchester. So um, you, know, you go up there and you start looking at the bugs and the uh, other things up there. We got a lot of unique things here in the, in the White Mountains. And of course, we have some unique birds. You know, we'll, we'll see American pipits down on, on the coast uh, for migration, but they actually breed on Mount Washington. It's the only place that we've been able to find them, not on Mount Jefferson or Adams, only on, uh, on Mount Washington, particularly in that um, um, area near the summit and along Gulfside Trail. That's uh, pretty popular. And also the Alpine Garden. Um, I'll leave it at that. I'm, I'm going to be doing some surveys for them and probably next week if I can get up, uh, up the mountain. Uh, this is a Bicknell's thrush, kind of an endemic high elevation species, goes down to um, uh, Haiti, Dominican Republic in the wintertime. Bicknell's thrush is what a lot of birders come up here for because it's found in our highest mountains. And you can take a tour on the Mount Washington all road to see Bicknell's thrush, or you can go up Caps Ridge Trail on Mount Jefferson, or go up Cannon Mountain on the tram, or hike up a number of these other mountains where the territories are and you can hear them. They tend to be a little bit shy. And another species found, uh, you know, during migration a little bit easier in the low elevations, but it is the most common warbler that we have 3,000 feet and above. It's the Black Pole Warbler. And they have this incredible flight all the way down to South America, thousands of miles. And, uh, and, and you'll see Black Poles up in Canada and, and and quite a ways west in Canada and, and Alaska. And of course, the boreal chickadee, and there's one, uh, one that's calling right in my room here. So uh, boreal chickadee, brown cap, uh, typically found 3,000 feet above uh, and above in that boreal forest region of the White Mountains. Uh, Black-backed woodpecker, this is a male. This is one of our favorites. This was out near Little Cherry Pond um, the spring, and uh, and you can see its tongue there, looking for looking for food. And the Canada or the gray jay, uh, always uh, always a favorite. Uh, good population in the White Mountains, particularly at trail junctions, and um, and one of my favorite birds. I think I want to come back as a as a Canada jay. And uh, last but not least, of course, in the White Mountain region, we do have spruce grouse. And, and uh, one of our viewers tonight indicated that she saw one uh, the other day in, uh, in the Chatham area, up Evans Notch area, I should say. And this is a male. Um, and this was up um, 
near Mount Jackson on the uh, Webster Cliff Trail. Uh, it has that red comb above the eye and uh, a pretty lovely bird. And, and uh, spruce grouse, they eat black spruce needles. Of course, they'll eat blueberries and, and, and fruit and things like that. And in September, they'll eat tamarack. But black spruce, if you're in a black spruce stand, look for the look for the spruce grouse because they're pretty specialist uh, birds that have that habitat. And, and you don't find them uh, south of the White Mountain region. So um, we're very fortunate that we do have spruce grouse here. So there we go, right on time. And um, thank you very much for uh, being on the survey. I'm sorry I didn't have things like coyote and white-tailed deer and flying squirrel and gray squirrel. I, I had those and woodchuck. I just had to, had to take them out because I knew this was only one hour and uh, I wanted to end with that. So with that, uh, if you have some questions, I'd be happy to, uh, to try to answer them. So do we have any questions? You might have to unmute, oh, let's see. Let's see what we got for chat here. Um, okay, um, uh, jo Johanna said that she counted over 200 pink lady slippers on the walk up Foss Mountain today. And, um, oh, and, and she said that the, uh, one time in the late winter, I saw a cat laying in a sunny patch on my road and went towards it, went here, kitty, kitty, and it got up and whoa, it was not a kitty, but a bobcat. Uh, that's, uh, that's pretty cool. I love to see bobcats. You know, there was a proposal to have um, a trophy hunt for bobcats. So you could put it above your, I don't know, fireplace or whatever. And the public got pretty upset with that. And they just, you know, these beautiful cats, they didn't think it was the proper thing to, um, to do. And uh, Castle in the Clouds Trail, big pile of bear scat with a shiny candy wrapper in it. Yeah, you know, that's one of the things about litter, you know, people, we we know, and it's just the small percentage. They throw litter on the side of the roads, and that attracts wildlife, who then potentially could get um, run over or hit. And they they develop this, you know, they they want to go for this human food because, of course, it is, you know, pretty good, you know, the candy and stuff like that. And so, you know, just go out of your way to um, pick up litter, and 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 if you can, you know, on the side of the roads and keep them clean. And, uh, and that's important. And so, you know, uh, every litter hurts a bit. So, uh, or is it every litter bit hurts? <laughs> it's one of those. <laughs> Anyways, all right, how do you manage land for snowshoe hair? <laughs> well, there, there are actually techniques that you do and it involves, you know, small clear cuts uh, to try to develop a habitat, a mix of conifers and hardwoods. And, and I could, um, um, try to get you the information there. And it's usually in patches that are about five, six acres in size. And so you want to have this thick regeneration coming in and you want to have the timing that's done right. And so you need a fair amount of land to work with. Uh, and so you'll have some cut and you wait several years. And, and snowshoe hare habitat typically will only last about 15 years unless it's alders, um, which will tend to last longer. But um, so trying to manage it, but not, you know, clear cutting a thousand acres, a little bit too much because uh, you'll have a lot, but it's only going to be a limited duration. Uh, and then that population will go up. Okay, question on mountain lions. Uh, mountain lions, uh, puma, cougar, that, you know, we'll, we probably have, you know, one coming through every now and then, particularly the males, they tend to, uh, you know, really uh, travel long distances, but there is no breeding population of mountain lions in New Hampshire or Vermont. There was a small population in, in Southern Quebec near the, just north of Jay Peak, I'll just say it at that, but that population I think is, is not existent right now. Uh, there's possibly some mountain lions in New Brunswick that get on over into, into Maine. Uh, there's certainly valid reports of mountain lions in, in Maine on that. All right, uh, other questions? 
one of uh, one of my favorite books. I'll uh, I'll try to hold it up here. It's um, let's see if we can see it. I'll read it to you. It's called Mammals of the North Woods, and it's a really neat little pocket book that uh, has sketches. I mean, you can put it in your back pocket, and it says North Woods. It's 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 really the Upper Great Lakes states, but almost all of the animals that we have around here uh, are in this book. And, uh, and there's a few extras that we don't have, for instance, the badger and uh, uh, let's see what else. There's a few others that are in there, but it's, it's a really cool book. And they have a whole series about 15 different books on this natural area. It's one of my favorites. And one of the most uh, interesting ones is this new Peterson guide Field Guide to Finding Mammals, and by Vladimir Dinets. It's a Peterson Field Guide to Finding Mammals. And what's interesting about it is it tells you where to go, where to look for animals. And it also tells you, and it's not just, you know, the terrestrial mammals, it's things like the marine mammals too, like um, killer whales and so forth and various kinds of seals and, and that. So, if, if you get a chance, it's a fun book. It talks about the animals and actually gets into subspecies and, and other things. So Peterson Field Guide to Finding Mammals. And one of the older books that I, I really like, it's by Helen at Silver. It's a history of New Hampshire uh, game and fur bearers. And you probably have a copy of that in the Tin Mountain Library and you could check with Nora or Lori and, and uh, and borrow that. It's, it's a really fun book. All right. Hey, Dave, you mentioned that um, a few species that really benefit from the snowshoe hare, and then at the end of that list, you said some that are predators. So, like, so some species that are benefiting from them aren't ones that eat eat them. Is that what you mean? Uh, uh, no. Uh, the um, there's so many predators out there that feed on snowshoe hare. Uh, that it's an important part. If if we lost all of the snowshoe hares, our forest would be con completely different than they are. We would, you know, we would lose a lot of the predator species. And so they're they're kind of a um, a keystone species and that we need to keep them. So it's it's predators like owls and hawks, coyote, uh, bobcat, lynx, uh, marten, fisher, even the ermine you know, everyone wants to take a bite of a snowshoe hare. It's kind of like the McDonald's uh, hamburger for, for some people, you know, that's what they want, hamburgers. Well, snowshoe hare is that, is that species. And, um, and the snowshoe hare, a rabbit? Oh, go ahead. what's that? And er, isn't an ermine like smaller than a rabbit? Yeah, yeah, they're, um, um, you know, the, the short-tailed weasel, the ermine, will be about four ounces and you're looking at a snowshoe hare of four or five pounds. And, and let me tell you, ounce for ounce, an ermine is probably the toughest predator that's out there, ounce for ounce. And, uh, you know, I've, they will come up to you uh, and, and, and bare their teeth on their hind legs if you get too close to them. Um, and they'll even come into the house, particularly the, uh, the short tail weasels will sometimes find a way to get in the house. Cats will actually are able to kill them, but uh, um, they are a pretty ferocious predator. So surprising that an animal as small as an ermine, say four or five ounces can kill an animal that's five pounds, but they can do it because they're, they have such sharp teeth and they uh, will bite the back of the neck and, and sever the spine. Incredible. All right, so let's see this next one from Sharon. Uh, wonderful pictures, of course. Uh, uh, we have a pair of loons on Pequawket Pond. Love their call. Uh, they let you get fairly close and kayak. Love the Zoom presentations. Also have a beav beaver family on Pequawket Pond. Thank you again. Yeah, I, I, I really love beavers, and I'm, I really hope you get a chance to um, check out these beaver deceivers if you're um, – if you're bicycling along the Presidential Rail Trail, particularly in the Randolph area, uh, by the Jefferson Notch Road where it crosses, you can you can head uh, find a place to park and head uh, west. And there's a couple of ponds there that we have a couple of the deceivers up, and they're working really great. And so the family 
of beavers and the kits are still there and surviving. And uh, beavers make such great habitat. It's a shame to have to go in and kill 20, 30 of them in, in the summertime. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to find alternatives and they're expensive. You know, a beaver deceiver to put it in the right way is a couple thousand dollars. But uh, in the long run, if you can keep them out of those culverts, you know, bringing, a, bringing an excavator and it costs you 150 to 200 bucks just to deliver it. And then it's a hundred bucks an hour to operate it. And then you got a, uh, you know, a, a couple of uh, operators. So it's a couple thousand dollars every time you go in to try to clean a culvert out from one of these places. And if they knock a road out, you know, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars to do it. So your return on the investment of these beaver deceivers, and I, and I don't have any money in the stock market or in beaver deceivers. So uh, um, I'm just saying, check it out. And um, if you have a problem somewhere, try to get your road crew to uh, consider beaver deceivers. Uh, do they require much maintenance? Um, not really because um, the filter box is so far out that uh, they don't get clogged. The beavers really can't figure that out. Uh, sometimes we have to put uh, plywood on top to keep them from looking down. It's the sound of running water that drives beaver beavers crazy. And it's the same, you know, it's kind of like me with uh, chocolate covered almonds from M&Ms, you know, it drives me crazy when I see them. Uh, but uh, it's that sound of running water that, uh, that they don't like. So these things work pretty effectively, need minimal maintenance. And, and of course, these culvert pipes that we use, the lifespan is 50 to 70 years on them. So they'll, they'll last a long time. But occasionally you might have a problem and uh, have to take care of it. Certainly a lot less than trying to put up a, a screen over a culvert that you have to frequently maintain. All right. Any other questions? Dave, I have a quick question for you. Um, yes, Nora. So a lot of the photography, a lot of the images that you used in this presentation were your own. Um, yes. I'm just curious what type of camera you use for wildlife photography. Uh, my go-to camera, uh, two of them. I got an iPhone. Uh, which is usually the one I use for flowers, I hate to say it. And uh, it's, it's actually pretty good. And, and any of the Android phones are excellent too nowadays. But the, the mainframe camera I use is a Sony RX10 um, Mark IV. And I used to have a fairly large uh, Canon camera and, you know, great uh, uh, camera, but the Sony is, is uh, fairly water resistant. It's a very heavy duty camera. It's got a 25 power zoom and it also has a macro lens. And it's, it's a pretty fast camera and it's got a pretty good card on it. So I really enjoyed using the Sony. Hi, Mike. <laughs> um, it looks like there's a follow up beaver deceiver question. Okay. Uh, just about oh, does. Yeah, from Cindy. Yeah, no, you, you, um, you know, they'll work. Uh, you know, sometimes we put them in as a preventative um, where we know that there's going to be some issues. Um, so it's, it's only the, uh, the sound of running water that makes the beavers want to dam, dam things up. So you, if you can avoid that sound of running water, they're probably fine. What, what we find that they do is they try to, um, build their dam up around the pipe, but the pipe's sticking out of the back of the dam. So the water's running out of it and uh, they just can't get up to it and to block it. All right. Uh, well, that looks like everything. And I see, hey, the moon is up. It's 91% illumination. I don't know, I'm looking out over Mount Washington, there's a big thunderhead. And I'm, I got my fingers crossed about doing a whippoorwill survey tonight, but it's looking good uh, for now. Nine o'clock, I'll get out there and whip it up. <laughs> oh, the other definition of wildlife related to college fraternities, but I won't, uh, <laughs> we'll leave it at that. <laughs> they never let me in one. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. It's a real honor to present for Tin Mountain and I hope that uh, 
you'll consider supporting Tin Mountain in any way you can and, uh, and keep up the good work and uh, hope to see you again. All right, yes, Dave, thank, thank you. Thanks, Dave, for, thank for you. another great yeah. program. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Bye now.